Welcome back again to Kilat Chavirim here in Yerushalayim. Parsha Shlach in Eretz Yisrael. And the Shem Yishmuel helps us look a little deeper into the Chet HaMiraglim. And that's going to also take us back to Parsha Spaloscha, which was in Israel last week, but is this week in uh, Chutzlaretz. So everybody gets something this week. Rashi said, Loma nismacha Parshas Miraglim la Parshas Miriam. Why is the Parsha of the Miraglim adjacent to the Parsha of Miriam? Okay, again, flashing back to our previous episode, Miriam and Aaron, who spoke about Moshe. The discussion was, following through with Rashi, right, why is it Moshe Rabbeinu separated from his wife Tzipora? We also had Nevoah. We didn't separate from our spouses. Okay, and that was viewed as something wrong. So Rashi says, Rishoyim halolu, rov chumusr. These Miraglim, who went to Eretz Yisrael and they came back with their bad report, they saw what happened to Miriam and they didn't learn from it. So the Shem Yishmuel asks, very practically, he says, right in Aramaic, it's lav b'nei chada b'ksoninu. It's apples and oranges. That's why you say it in, in Aramaic, it's apples and oranges. He says, the chait of Miriam was something personal in which she was speaking about Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, we'll get later into what the very, very tiny, tiny infraction was there. Okay, the Rambam emphasizes that she loved Moshe, she respected Moshe, uh, all these uh, things, there was something tiny there. And Chetam Maraglim was Shelohem Minu Bashem, Velobotchu This is an entirely different thing. Hashem is saying, okay, let's go to Eretz Yisrael. And they said, ah, it's scary there. And he says, and this is based on the drasha, on the pasuk later where he said, "Lo nucha lalo selam ki chazukul mimenu." We cannot go up to that land and those people who live there because chazukul mimenu. So Rashi brings down. They said stronger than Hashem. Hashem can't do that. Okay. Now, obviously, we have to understand all these things. Okay. So. So what is it? And again, Moshe continues on when he chastises them. He says, It's a lack of emuna. No one accused Miriam and Aaron of lack of emuna. So what are we doing with these apples and oranges? So obviously, and really, Bamidbar has lots of sins. Okay, there was a story about two of the tzaddik in Poland, I forget. One was looking a little bit down. So his friend said to him, what are you looking down for? He says, when we get to these parashas, Am Yisrael do so many averas. And he said to him, yeah, but look how much Torah came out of it. You know, it's like this is a, a bright side to it. Okay, so he says, Aaron and Miriam, stepping back to their complaint, it wasn't just yenting in the family, right? If it's written down in the Torah, this discussion that was there, they had some type of concern that involved the entire endeavor of the Jewish people. What was it? Moshe Rabbeinu did something that was unique. Jews marry. Jews are meant to marry. The Pelner Rebbe always points out that the Kohen Godel on Yom HaKippurim, call it your holiest person, on the holiest day of the year, going into the Kodesh Kadoshim, the holiest place on the planet, must be married. If something happened to his wife, he could not go in. He discussed about the idea of preparing a wife on deck, so to speak, to use the baseball term, right, in case he had to get remarried quickly because he couldn't, okay? But Moshe Rabbeinu was unique, okay? And that was, let's just parenthetically flesh out a little bit what they say about what happened with Miriam and Aaron. The only problem was comparing Moshe Rabbeinu to other Naveen, right? Not taking into account that it could be that Moshe Rabbeinu's experience of Navu was entirely different even than other Nevi'im here, right? Because it's fascinating. One of the things people always pull out of the closet when you're speaking about someone is litoelis. It's kind of like that thing people do on Shabbos, uh, you know, Nish Shabbos Karet, you know, Nish Shabbos Karet, do you want to go out tonight? Right, Nish Shabbos Karet, when should I pick you up? And all these things, just, right? not to talk about it on Shabbos, but let's talk about it on Shabbos. So an introduction, so to speak, to try and put a kosher stamp on your Russian Haras, I'm just saying this to Toelis, okay? Now, here, this really seemed like Toelis, right? Miriam and Aaron were concerned about Moshe Rabbeinu, about Am Yisrael, so why didn't they get a pass because of Toelis? 
So the Chavetz Chaim brings down that this idea of to'eles, or a positive purpose, only works if it's not based on false assumptions. If you have misjudged someone, and then you're speaking Lashon Hara, so to speak, with to'eles, based on your misjudgment, the to'eles doesn't help you. So here, that was this misjudgment. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, separated himself from Derech Eretz. He really separated from matters of this world much more than any other human being in history. Past, present, future. Okay, now their worry was if he would be so different in his avoda than Am Yisrael, so then there has to be a connection between the tzaddik and the generation. He's meant to influence them. If he is so far and so different and so removed in his avoda, their fear was that there would be that loss, okay? That there would be no connection. He wouldn't be able to transmit, to influence, to shine on Am Yisrael. And Moshe Rabbeinu should have given up on whatever level he was achieving there for the greater good of Am Yisrael. So the reason this was considered a chet was they should have, he said, das Moshe. they should have been mevatel themselves to the das of Moshe. Understanding, he says, what Chazal said, listen to the chachomim, even if they say, al smol shu yomin val yomin shu smol. Right, that famous thing, the Apostle in Shoftim, yomin usmol, don't swear from what they tell you left or right. So Rashi brings down there, Afilu Omer al Smol Shu Yamin Va Yamin Shu Smol. Even if he tells you left is right and right is left. Okay, now why would he tell you left is right and right is left? So the beautiful and simple explanation I heard is that when I'm standing opposite you, right, I'm saying that's right, and you're telling me that's left, because we're both looking at it from two different perspectives. Okay, so the understanding is meant to be that the Chacham sees this, and they were supposed to assume, Shevada Yatzedekitovu, Mevin Das Atorv, Ratzon Hashem Yisbarach Yosem Mehem, that they had to believe that he understood what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted, and that he knew the effects on Am Yisrael, and he's different from them. Okay, so this was the problem. This is what Hashem told them. He said, Lo Chen Avdi Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu is different than anyone else. So he says, the Pagam, which was there, is really in what's called Teresh Meaning, coming and saying that, okay, I want to interpret this differently than the way Moshe Rabbeinu interpreted it. That is really putting a monkey wrench in the works of Teresh even in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. So this was the problem over there. Now, when it comes to the Miraglim, it's similar. Okay? And again, right, he points out for Miriam and Aaron, it wasn't just a suspicion, because we saw just before that, that they had the chait of the Mis'onanim and Kivro Satava. Suddenly, Am Yisrael are screaming for meat. Suddenly, they're falling into depression. They're saying, must have lost the connection to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, you got to come down. Now, what's interesting is that Moshe Rabbeinu said the same thing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in a conversation that they may not have heard. When he says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he says, Have I been pregnant with these people? Right? Have I given birth to them? Right? You're going to tell me, Carry this baby in your you know, womb, in your arms, like a, a woman carries... The newborn child, he says, "In Seli, if this is what you're doing to me, Hargeni Naharog, kill me." So the parish, which is brought down, and I saw it in a few places, bring my madriga down, right? Bring down my madriga. If I am not able to help them, let's step back. I'm sorry, I'm jumping. So let's do it in an orderly way. There's a Morva Shemesh. The Morva Shemesh is one of the early Hasidic Perushim on the Chumash. And he explains this dialogue that Moshe Rabbeinu had in the following way. He said, first of all, the progression in Parshas Baloscha, it starts off, It's a very strange description, because Mis'onanim is related to the word onen, which in the 
cycle of mourning is the deepest, right, darkest part of mourning in the very beginning. And it just says that was Rabbi Hashem. It doesn't say why they were down. It doesn't say that. Then it moves on. It says, That the heir of Rav started having these desires and lusts. And then all of Am Yisrael started getting into this. He says, depression, obviously, is the great enemy. Right? It's called in the Sephorim. Right, the black bitterness. And that in itself is something that must be avoided. That in itself is negative. Now, one result, one symptom of certain types of depression is this idea of trying to run away from the depression by just physical pleasure. Right? It's kind of what they call nowadays emotional eating. Right? A lot of people when they're stressed out. When you're depressed, so you go, you eat a pint of ice cream, and you see the empty pint, you get depressed that you ate a pint of ice cream, so you eat a bag of chips, and it kind of goes in a cycle, right? And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu said, right, this strange sentence where he said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, bakar right, how much, you can't do this, right? You're going to give them all the sheep, all the cattle, even if you'll the ayom, even if you'll give them all the fish in the sea, right, this is not going to help. Why isn't it going to help? How much can they eat? The answer is, because he was saying, I know this is not physical. He says, this is a cycle that they're in, and each step they take, it's getting worse. Now, he said, why can't I help them? He says, I do not experience things the same way that they do. I can eat a pint of ice cream, or he probably wouldn't even eat the pint. He would have a bowl of ice cream. He makes a bracha. Or he puts it down. He has the, the ice cream. And it only elevates me. I thank Hashem for the ice cream he gave me. I say my bar in the afterwards. I absorb the ruchnias and the physical nourishment which is in there. It's great. It's not bringing me down. It's not leading me on this track of addictive pleasure seeking. So how can I help them? Right? If we want to use a, a simple image, if you imagine... An alcoholic, right? Somebody says, come down to Kiddush after davening. He says, no, I, I can't go down to Kiddush. Why? He says, no, because I'm an alcoholic and I have to stay away. You should just do like I do. I have a cup of wine and then I have one little schnapps with the herring. Do like I do. He doesn't understand that for this person, that little schnapps with the herring right, can, can send him into a tailspin that destroys his life. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, so what am I supposed to do? So here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the solution. He said, take the Shivim Zakenim. You should take these 70 Zakenim and you will put from your Ruach on them. And these are people that, the Mar Vashemish explained, they're not on your level. They have, they know the battle. They're ahead of the other people. But they've been through it and they're still in it. And this is what Chazal meant. They said, Ein Mamanim. You don't appoint a leader of a community. You've got to have a past in order to help the people. You have to know where they're coming from. So does that mean that Moshe Rabbeinu should retire? Absolutely not. Their Kedusha comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. Everything comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. Just they were created as the bridge to connect Moshe Rabbeinu to them. So, in reality, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had set into motion already something which would deal with that problem that Miriam and Aaron said. Okay, so again, a person can ask, a person can care, but you have to be very careful with that idea of judging and thinking somehow that I can understand it more than Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, when it comes to Miraglim, he says a similar type of thing. He says, it's very strange. It's very strange that Am Yisrael, and these were Kulam Anoshim, these were special people, could be scared of what was in Canaan. Let's remember recent history. This is not after 40 years in the desert. This is just a couple of years ago. They saw the Nisim and Mitzrayim, the entire empire. They saw 10 Makos. They saw Kriyas Yamsuf. They were surrounded by these miraculous clouds in the desert. So I don't care how big the giants are. Boy, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what's the difference between this giant or that giant or anything that's there? So they have big grapes. We're afraid of big grapes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu can do anything. 
It, does, it just doesn't make sense. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu told them. He says, don't be afraid with them. Don't be afraid. Hashem goes before you. He will fight for you. Right? He says, Just like it did in Egypt before your very eyes. And they didn't have an answer for that. So why is it, how is it the Miraglim were able to make their decision and to cause the Jewish people to become so afraid? So obviously he says there's something deeper going on here. He says they felt that all of the Nisim that they had in Mitzrayim, all the Nisim they had in the Midbar were from the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. Again, Moshe Rabbeinu was unique. And he was the one who brought all these things about. And they also knew that Moshe Rabbeinu was not going to come in with them. This was the content of that Nevu of Eldod and Medod in the end of Parshas Baloscha. Moshe Meis, Yeshua, Achnisenu Eretz Yisrael. Moshe is going to die, Yeshua is going to take us into Eretz Yisrael. Now, he, say, he, he says, interesting, he quotes the Gemara in Sanhedrin, that Moshe Rabbeinu did not know this. Right? Yeshua did not tell Moshe Rabbeinu what was the content of Eldad and Medad's nevuah that he was upset with. So Moshe Rabbeinu was not told this, and they felt that they could not tell Moshe Rabbeinu this prophecy that's going to be happening. So therefore, they did the following cheshbon. We are going to go into Eretz Yisrael. Yes, Hashem wants us to go. But the only type of miracles we can expect are nisim melubashim b'derech ha Not great blockbuster, super special effect Moshe Rabbeinu type nisim, but the more miraculous things through nature. The only problem is these people who are facing off against are supernatural. That's what we saw. These people, the powers, the spiritual force that was in the land of Canaan, which again is a reflection of the very Kedusha which is in there, just the flip side of the coin. Okay, so he says, there we need more. And we don't have the schus without Moshe Rabbeinu to have those things. So what was their plan? We are going to elevate ourselves. Hashem said, go into Eretz Yisrael. Penu usu lachem ubo har ha'emori. They said, penu can mean a different parish. It doesn't mean turn to Eretz Yisrael and go in. It means turn away, become more internal, spend more time in the Midbar, right, perfecting yourselves, elevate yourselves till you'll be worthy of supernatural miracles that you'll need to conquer Eretz Yisrael. That was what they were doing. So he says what this is again, is Lefaresh Kavona Satara, they're explaining the Kavona of the Torah against what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, you know what Hashem means? He means, get on your donkeys, off you go into Eretz Yisrael. Don't worry about the giants, don't worry about everything, you're covered. He said, eh, no, eh, we think he means that we should get more holy first, and then do it. Okay, if Moshe Rabbeinu said that's the parish, that's the parish. This is again a rebellion against Tarash Peh. To be Mefarish Apostle, not the way Moshe Rabbeinu said, that is the same thing. Now, he says something. I, I asked a friend to help me find the source for this. Anyone who can help me find this? I think I've seen things like this. He says, Yadua Mavinim is known to those who understand, which I guess I'm not. Eretz Yisrael and Torah are one and the same. I did see some things about the transition from the Midbar to Eretz Yisrael being a transition from Torah Shabbat to Torah Shabbat, meaning applying the Torah into the whole Metzius in Eretz Yisrael is the idea of Torah Shabbat Peh. So therefore, if they rebelled against Torah Shabbat Peh, this damaged their connection to Eretz Yisrael. It damaged the way they viewed Eretz Yisrael, and then negativity seeped into the point that it would say, Vayimasu be'eretz chemda, that they were revolted by the beautiful, desirable land. That's what can happen. So he says, this is why they should have learned from Miriam. It was the same principle. It's idealistic. It's caring about Am Yisrael, okay? These silly perushim that, you know, people like to turn the stories in Bamidbar 
into us. Yeah, Aaron and, uh, you know, Miriam and Moshe. Yeah, family problems, soap opera, you know, this, probably a bad relationship. Should have had counseling, all these things. And here, you know, the, the Meraglim, yeah, it was all about power and position. Even what it says with Chazal, they said that we wanted to be heads. So Hashem has a beautiful explanation that it means, again, just as the head influences the body, they wanted more time in the Midbar to elevate Am Yisrael, a similar approach to what we have here. So it was a problem in Tur Shabal Peh, and the problem in Tur Shabal Peh caused the problem that happened then in Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so this really gives us a fascinating picture of our relationship with things. On one hand, we know that the Iker of our learning is to ask questions. I'll tell you something that I saw years ago that was disturbing. Um, it was a university student showed me, he was taking a class called Yiddish Literature, okay? And um, there the teacher touched upon one of the sources, some, some translated book of Yiddish stories, mentioned the Gemara, the Talmud, Tarsha Balpeh. So to explain to the class what that was, he took a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine that showed a bunch of executives sitting around the big executive table playing the game of telephone. All right, so you see from the bubbles over their head, one person says something, put the flowers in the pot, and then it gets garbled and switched till the very end. The person says, uh, put the mustard in the car or something, and everybody laughs, and it's a great party playing the game of telephone. So under that, he wrote the first mission in Pirkei Ovos. Moshe kibul Torah misinai umasar the Yeshua avishul zakeni zakeni the vim the vim man shekin es zagdola. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai and gave it. In other words, his implication. You know why Jews do so many weird things? They've been playing telephone for thousands of years, right? This idea of an oral law, right? No wonder they're doing all, all this wacky stuff. Now, a person that looks at this, you know, just with two eyes, sees what are the basic differences between the game of telephone. And Teresh The game of telephone, first of all, you're trying to say it quietly because your party's no fun if the thing doesn't change. In the game of telephone, you're not allowed to ask the person, what did you say? In Teresh everything is about asking, questioning, comparing everything in all of the database, one to the other, to see and to sense, right, and to look for that consistency. I want to share a beautiful story that I heard uh, in a recording for Vuri Zorzal, he passed away just the other week. And uh, this was one, I, I'd, I'd heard different things from him, I'd read different things from him. This aspect of his story I'd never heard before. He was again famous, the Johnny Carson of Israel, the most famous entertainer and movie maker. Israelis told me when his show was on TV, it was like Yom Kippur in the streets. Everybody was watching, nobody was outside. And then in the 1970s, he met Rob Zilberman, uh, the founder of the Zilberman community in the Old City, through a friend, and he had some serious discussions with him, and he went on a search for the truth. Now, the aspect that he didn't always describe there was that he was married at the time, and his wife wasn't on that same trip with him. They both grew up in a very non-religious environment, non-religious youth movements. They had a beautiful house in Yafo, and here he was getting seriously thrown. So he said one night they had the discussion. The discussion was, can they continue to remain married? And what it would be based on was, would she be willing at least to keep certain basic practical aspects of Torah, Kashrut, Shabbos, Taras HaMishpacha? He said they talked late into the night, and the conclusion was that they would have to break up. He said he was very sad. He was walking upstairs. As he walked upstairs, he said he had just started buying some Jewish books. He looked down, and he'd had, he bought a set of the Rambam. He saw his wife take out a volume of the Rambam. Next morning, he got up, he came downstairs. She was waiting for him. He says he didn't know if she slept or not. She said, I can do those things. I can do those things. He said he so much wanted to ask her what she read in the Rambam, they changed their mind, but he so much didn't want to mess with it. <laughs> he, said, he said, thank you. Right? <laughs> he said, months later, when things felt more stable, he said, I have to ask you, that night when we had that talk, and we were going to break up, I saw you take out the Ramah. What was it? What, what did it? What did you read? She says, I have to tell you, she said, I didn't understand the word. I saw that it was serious. 
I saw that it wasn't just a list of mumble jumbo and traditions. I saw that things were being stated and sourced, and these commentaries were asking questions on things, and I saw it was something serious I can deal with, something serious I can do. If you're just going to come and tell me to do these weird practices, I'm not doing that. When I saw that it was serious, it was there. That respect for Teresh Balpeh is so key. And that's why the Shem Shmuel finishes by saying, he says, that this Pagam in Teresh Balpeh, this really affects our ability to return to Eretz Yisrael in the full sense as we should and be able to live here in the full sense. In Vayikar Rabba, Ena Goliath Miskansu Selebiskus Amishnayas, Shem Teresh Balpeh that the exiles will only truly be gathered in, in the schus of the Mishnayis. And he says, because of this, move on, we understand that the Yetzirah and all of his forces, right, the messengers of destruction, they put all their efforts in this last Golos, and certainly in the end of the Golos, in the final generation, Levatel is Yisrael mitar to be mevatel that connection of Am Yisrael from Tar Now let's let's try to explain this a little bit and to understand why and what's happening here. Knowledge of Tar just doesn't mean being able to recall things. When we talk about the idea and what it says here that you're supposed to listen to the Chachamim. A person could say, especially not there's translations, I can read, I can argue with him, and again, learn, argue, why is it that because the Shulchan Aruch said something, so that's it? Why is it that if they decided that Allah is like base Hillel aside from certain places, why I like Beis Shammai better? Why am I locked into this? Where is it coming from? So he says, this is the idea of understanding and having respect for where things come from. Innovation, pointing out problems and coming, the Torah is endlessly innovative. He says the reason our Golas, the second Golas, which really is connected to Cheta Maraglim, the first Golas, Chazal said, is connected to Cheta Egel. That was a revealed sin, and so too the sins in the time of the Beis Amikdash, the first one, were revealed, and their Golas was revealed, 70 years. Our Golas was not. The sins made on the Chavero Sinas Chinam were not clearly seen, and the goals that we have has no set end. He says, because Torah Shabbat Peh is endless and infinite. And when we've damaged the connection with Torah Shabbat Peh, there's no border or boundary to that. We have to repair that connection. So what we say here doesn't mean that the process of looking at the problems of the Jewish people and delving into the Torah to find those things which are for each generation that's certainly positive, and we've seen that being done and happening throughout. But it has to be done within the framework of Torah Shabbal Peh, which is a process, and the keystone of that process are the Chachamim of each generation who have received that Torah Shabbal Peh. Again, Torah Shabbal Peh, by its very essence, is a transmission of generation to generation. Even after Abuda Anasi wrote down the Mishnah, and even after we have the Talmud written down, the Baalpeh aspect is there. And that idea of respecting that is the key. Every time that Am Yisrael veered from that, tried to come up with other solutions for Jewish survival, well-meaning, they said, if, if we don't let Jews drive to the temple on Shabbos, right, they're all going to disappear and intermarry. Right? The, the Torah didn't know that people were going to be living so far away in the suburbs from each other. Right? We have to do it. But once again, it's like saying Hashem can't bring Am Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael. Right? Why? Because he can, and he's thought of it also. And if he put boundaries, that means that the plan for him and for our world is able to go through. It's a fascinating brisker of. There's a Gemara. It talks, it's a very mysterious Gemara about one of the Chachamim asking Eliyahu Anovi what we can do to bring the Geula. So he let him know a secret. He said, if you will make a tefillah in which Rabbi Chia and his sons lead the tefillah, that'll do the trick. So they took Rabbi Chia and his sons and they put him up to lead the davening. 
And they said, Mashi Varuach, and huge winds started blowing. And they said, Murida Geshem, and rain started to pour. And they were just going to be getting up to the idea of Mechaya Mesim, and the world started to shake. And there was uproar in the heavenly court. They said, who leaked this? They caught Elio Novi, who was punished for this, and the tefillah was disturbed, and it didn't go through. Okay, again, a Gemara you could spend a long time figuring out. Now, Tosus asked a question. They said, how could they make Rabbi Chia Chazim? It says in another place in the Gemara, that Rabbi Chia didn't pronounce certain letters correctly. The place where he came from, and uh, you can't put him up if he doesn't pronounce it correctly. And they came up with an answer as to why it would be okay. So the Briskarov said, take a look at that Tosus for a second. We would want to tell Tosus, excuse me? Eliyahu Novi said that Mashiach comes if he's chazan. He's chazan, okay? What do you do? Well, he doesn't pronounce really. What do, you, what do you mean? He says that's exactly what it's showing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan is how and what and when he does things is not a thing. If there's a Torah which is given, the only pathway to where we're supposed to go goes through that Torah. The idea of, uh, of taking that shortcut, uh, of doing it, it won't get anywhere. But, but, it doesn't matter. But, but, that's the power of Torah Shabbat, Peh, which was given to us. That's the Chaye Olam Nota B'Sochenu that we're supposed to be leading here in the world. So I just want to finish by explaining a little bit how this applies in our generation as well. There's an idea, right, uh, in Chabad they talk a lot, it's brought from the Zohar Kodesh, we spashtu say the Moshe b'chol dor. Right, there's an aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu in every generation. Yiftach b'doro, kishmuel b'doro. Every generation has its leaders, the Rambam and the Akdama to Mishnah Torah, describes in each generation, even though there were many Chachomim, says this one was in charge of the transmission of Torah Shabbat Pam, that generation. This one and that one. Now again, as we've gone into Golas, the Torah has become more dispersed, and... Um, we have different things. Nonetheless, the idea of that person who is the person who has absorbed Torah Peh is not a walking database. It's a person who has absorbed the Torah to the extent that it lives within him. That it's not an idea of recall, of looking up uh, on a database, what's this or what's that, or to compare to that. It's someone who is able to see and sense the world really through different glasses. If you imagine someone who's looking through infrared you know, uh, light sensors or x-ray glasses, they, they see the world differently because of it. I remember hearing, uh, I think it was Rabbi Willig, saying that once uh, he was learning Chavrusa with a virtual Shechter, okay, both of them giants of Torah, and they thought they had a sugya down very, very well. And they had a question, and they came to their Rabbi Rusal, and he brought something it wasn't a quote from someplace else. It was something that was an inference from an entirely different topic in Shas that cast a whole different light on everything that they were learning. That's because that was, that was alive in him. The principles are alive. It's, it's there. It's a different type of existence. Have a Masunim Badin, when Chazal say you're supposed to be deliberate in your judgment. Go slow when you're judging. The Maral says that's for Dayonim, to go slow because they need to somehow elevate themselves and to be able to grasp the Chochmah El Yonah of the Torah. Right? This is, and to be able to bring it inside of themselves and to look and see. So this is why it's important to know that this process which is described here affected us then, it affects us now so much. The process that he mentions here, the attacks on Torah Shabbat Peh, which were there in his time and which are here as well, right, are things that we have to be aware can affect us, our very survival, our connection to Eretz Yisrael, our unity as a people. All those things are there, and that's why Tisha B'Av is the night of Chet Maragni. Tisha B'Av is the night in which we always go back to that. And the repair to it is drawing on Torah Shabbat Peh in a legitimate way, infinite variety, all the wonderful drachim that came out, if they're authentic to Dara Shabal Peh, even if they're different from each other, they're all wonderful. The Kutzke Rebbe said that what Rav Hirsch was in Frankfurt, oh no, the Imre I'm sorry, the Rebbe said what Rav Hirsch was in Frankfurt was what the Kutzke was in Poland. In Poland, not Poland. Very different drachim, all authentic from Dara Shabal Peh, all addressing different needs that we have. 
But when it comes to the idea of trying to outsmart the system, the most dangerous thing is when it's done out of idealism, when it's done out of Avas Yisrael, when it's, when it's done out of Avas Hashem, Hashem, I love you, I love your people, I want to get the world to where you want it to get to, and in order to do that, i got to reinterpret your thing a bit. That's where we get in trouble. Okay, so this was the comparison that kind of just slips by us reading Rashi between Miriam and the Chet of Miriam and Aaron and the Chet of Miraglim, what they could have and should have learned, and what hopefully all of us will learn, always to finish on the positive, the wonder that Torah Shabbal Peh is with us, alive and kicking, and uh, that it's guiding us and addressing us, and the Alman Yisrael, Am Yisrael is never orphaned, there are always Chachomim in each generation to be able to draw on the Torah and teach us, and with that we will hopefully reach the goal. Everyone have a wonderful week, wonderful Shabbos.